Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to the ninth installation of Coming Clean with the Dirty Dozen, where we put the finest explorers into your living room twice a week. My name is Aaron Angramson, and I'm going to be your host tonight. And uh, before we introduce our special guest, I just want to, as per usual, bring out uh, our crew behind the scenes in this uh, community project. So, Jeff and Vic, how are you guys doing? Hey, Aaron, how are you? Yeah, we're good. All good. Are you all good from the rehearsal yesterday? I'm excited about tonight. It's going to be a good show. Absolutely. Yeah, it was fascinating stories from Kirk yesterday. So uh, uh, we're really looking forward to it. Yeah, we have lots of media to keep you busy for sure. Uh, <laughs> Vic, uh, so you're ready to get all the questions from the audience. Let's remind them if you want to ask something, you can. And uh, Vic's going to take your questions and, and ask Kirk directly throughout the broadcast. Yeah, all guys. Right? See you later. See you later. So yeah, that was Jeff. He's our operator and producer in Chepstow running the broadcast. And then we have Vic, who's our producer and, and content creator. Um, so before we get started for any of our new viewers, because I, I can imagine there's some free divers uh, watching this episode, uh, I want to I want to introduce what Dirty Dozen is. So the Dirty Dozen Expeditions is an expedition company, naturally. Uh, and usually we find ourselves in Truck Lagoon, Bikini, Galapagos, Myanmar, Chernobyl, you name it. Uh, that's what we do. Obviously, right now, during the COVID-19 uh, crisis, we're all finding ourselves uh, within our home. And uh, the reason we're doing this is because uh, in our business model, we have lots of very good friends, special guests, high-profile divers on our trips. And uh, we decided to reach out to them and uh, just have a great conversation, uh, ask, let the audience ask them some questions and just try and have some uh, have some fun. So uh, that's what that's what coming clean uh, with Dirty Dozen is all about. So with any uh, further ado, I want to introduce our guest tonight, Kirk Kroc. Uh, so as a pioneer in the freediving world, Kirk Kroc has been on a quest to make the sport as safe as possible for over two decades. Diving for over 30 years professionally, Kirk has been a freediver at heart all his life. In 1996, he was working as a TriMix instructor trainer at his dive center, Dive Tech, which boasted the largest gas planning system in the Caribbean. It was here, while in Grand Cayman, when he was first introduced to the competitive freediving world. Kirk became further intrigued by the physiology of the sport and began to learn how freedivers were able to reach such extreme depths on a single breath. And from then on out, in January 2000, Kirk formed Performance Freediving International, or PFI, in order to create and implement freediving safety and training standards. Kirk developed educational philosophy, standards, procedures, and manuals that PFI is built on. To this day, Kirk continues to improve and perfect the PFI system with the newest and most innovative techniques. After training more than 10,000 students, coaching seven athletes to 23 different world records, among these Kirk's wife, Mandy, who he trained and coached to seven world records and 13 Canadian national records, Kirk shares everything he learns with his students in his never-ending journey for more knowledge. As an active mover on the film scene, something we'll be discussing tonight, Kirk's uh, credits include training people like David Blaine, Tom Cruise, Rebecca Ferguson, Margaret Robbie, the actors on the set of James Cameron's Avatar, and the movie The Cove. In 2016, recently, uh, Kirk received the Dan Rolex Diver of the Year Award as the first freediver to do so. In short, Kirk has devoted his professional life to the improvement of safety, the advancement of knowledge, and the proliferation of education in the sport and recreation of freediving. So, without any further ado, I thought maybe we should uh, say hello. Hey, Kirk, how's it going, brother? Yeah, good. How are you doing? <laughs> Excellent. It's good to see you. How uh, how are things going, and where are you at the moment? Uh, I'm home, so I'm in Campbell River, British Columbia, Canada, uh, quarantining with the family. Get yards never look better. Gardens never been fuller. So, <laughs> you know, what else do you do during this time, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, we've been talking to, you know, we had eight episodes so far. We've been talking to guests from all over the world. Uh, what is lockdown like where you are at this moment, at this time of the pandemic? 
Oh uh, yeah, here it's, I mean, it's, it's good. Um, thankfully we're going into spring, into summer where, you know, we can full, fill our garden up. Um, I, I'd hate to be going into this in, in winter and not being able to garden, you know, from a food security <laughs> point of view. Sure. Um, but in Canada, we've done really good as far as, as, you know, relatively as far as it goes. British Columbia, we're really good here. And Vancouver Island, we got a natural moat of the sea around us and we shut off the ferries for, for several weeks. So, uh, yeah, I mean, we've had pretty much a flattened curve here the whole time and everyone takes it serious and then it's pulling together to do what they should do. Yeah, it's what I'm finding with uh, people that are isolated, like where I'm from in Iceland, they're doing really good uh, for, for, for that reason as well. Um, how, how's business <laughs> or the lack of it, so to speak? For all Yeah, this? what business, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, who's out there training? Um, no, I mean, basically things in hibernation right now. Yeah. And, um, and within uh, PFI, which is now part of the TDI, SDI, ERDI and first response brands, diving brands um we're just doing a lot of work reaching out to our customers and our clients and uh really putting the work in uh sowing the seeds so to speak because at some point we're going to get through this the sun's going to shine and and the work you do now um will pay off then so you know keep positive i mean this is one momentary blip in in time for us and we'll get through it it's just you gotta it's hard to keep a positive attitude but you sure. gotta i mean we'll we'll get through it so the species will continue exactly i mean i've seen uh, tdi sdi pfi have been doing this project dive hashtag dive strong that's been kind of cool with the community getting a bit together yeah uh, any any other cool projects that have come out of the lockdown that you can tell us about oh yeah absolutely i mean a really significant one with uh first response um which is for those that don't know it's basically a, a first aid training company and uh, international training is really a technology customer service company with their online platforms and something that was really just launched today was in response to covid 19 and you know people getting back to work in states and provinces and countries opening up again how do employers um ensure that their employees have the right information to come back to just work in a workplace and then how do you deal with customers so we created this online platform in which uh, an employer can basically register as a facility, get all of his employees in line, say by whatever, by this Friday, everyone will have to have mm -hmm. gone through this thing. And it takes them through all of the practicalities and, and um, the medical aspects of just, you know, working in the new normal and it's free. So, I mean, who wouldn't do it? And it gives those, those instructors, those employers, uh, you know, a, a level of liability protection because they've done due diligence and safe practices and getting their uh, their employees up to speed. So we're pretty excited about that. That's really exciting. I'm, I'm quite impressed, to be honest, with how the industry has been handling all this. Everybody's gotten really creative and found some really cool initiatives they can do uh, within themselves. Uh, but without any further ado, uh, Kirk, it's time to get the pleasantries over All and right. get, get you in the hot seat. Get down to business, right? <laughs> it's All right. right. You come clean with the dirty dozens. So uh, <laughs> okay. let's take it from the very beginning. You've been in the water since you were very young. Uh, so how was your introduction to uh, to diving, free diving, and the rest of it like? Um, so I don't really remember swimming. I don't really remember starting free diving or being introduced to it. It's just something I grew up with. You know, my uh, my family, we were big into the water. I grew up sailing with my parents. Um, and uh, I've been a lifeguard and a swim instructor and did all that. But when I was 14, my parents bought me as a surprise for my birthday, bought me uh, scuba lessons. And so, I mean, you know, blown away in, in the pool for the whole winter, learning how to scuba dive. And then come spring when the ice was barely off the lake in a wetsuit that was too large, you know, too large in a BC that was swimming all over me, I head down to the bottom and freezing cold. And the first skill as we hit the murk and the silt pops up as the instructor pops through the silt and says, take your mask off, you know? So I drank a gallon of water through my nose, managed to get it. And, and in fact, it was a really important lesson for me as an instructor throughout the whole of my career is sure. to 
the empathy of what your students go through because it was a challenge. I mean, this, you know, I'm a water person, but yet in that situation, and we all have these hurdles to get over. So I always go back to that, especially when I teach my instructors. It's like, no matter how simple this skill seems, yeah. everyone's got a challenge to get through. And so that was one of mine. But uh, yeah, that's when I really started. And then uh, in 88, uh, 1988, I became a recreational scuba instructor. Within a year, I had gotten back from the Cayman Islands where I'd been, uh, you know, became an instructor, went to the Caymans, worked as a boat captain, all of that sort of stuff. Uh, came back home and I bought a dive shop in uh, October, actually Halloween, October 31st, uh, 1989. <laughs> bought my first dive shop from a guy I'd worked for the previous summer and, uh, you know, started on my uh, track. And then I think by 91 or 92, I was into nitrox and became a nitrox instructor and by 93 and there, I think I became a technical instructor and instructor trainer and then kind of sold that business off to a good friend, George Mueller from the diving center and um, proceeded to teach sailing and, you know, do more instructor training stuff in Vancouver area and then moved down to the Cayman Islands and started mm -hmm. a company there called Dive Tech with uh, a couple of friends, Dan Hodgins being a lifelong friend. And we started up really the first technical facility in, uh, in Cayman. And I think probably one of the first ones in the Caribbean and, and just went gangbusters with it. Yeah, no, and, and we all know Dive Tech today as it is. So uh, how did you get into free diving while you were in the, in the Caymans? What was your introduction to it there? Yeah, so... Um, so I was big into technical diving. Um, hmm. You know, I'd run like three weeks straight almost every day, maybe one day off if I was lucky doing all sorts of teaching, but primarily technical diving. A lot of times out running decompression programs at that time, and I'd have to do these innovative ways to see if I could you know, zero out my tissue saturations by 100% <laughs> oxygen reading a book at night for three hours in the evening. Yeah, right. Um, and then start again. But um, when we were there, because we had the equipment and we had the people and the facilities and everything, we got approached by a Cuban freediver, Pepin Freres, to do a, a record. And it was him and his wife, Audrey, and uh, another Brazilian girl who came down. And so we set up all the safety and the organization and stuff for that. But, but actually what's interesting is, is probably about half a year, six months before that, we had a gentleman from Italy who was on his honeymoon. And he came and was diving with us and he told us about this apnea club he was involved in. And, you know, <laughs> apnea, like that triggered off sleep apnea in my mind. Right? Yeah, so right. I thought, what kind of club is this? And then as he explained <laughs> it, this, you know, free diving club um, and he wanted to get his 30 meter badge. And, and could we help him prove that he did this 30 meter dive? And so I couldn't find any rules or regulations or standards. So I, I wrote up like a page and a half of how we were going to do this thing. And, uh, you know, like scuba divers every 10, five, you know, five meters and all of this sort of thing. And in the end, he, you know, we managed to document that for him. And then six months later, here comes Pepin, this world record guy. And so, um, you know, we did this two breath record thing that he did at the time to 515 mm. feet. And that really opened me up into what was the organized or, or at the time the organized world. Because really back then it was about, you know, in, in the old days, the grandfathers for us were Bob Croft, U.S. Navy, sure. submarine retired, three world records. First guy to go beyond 200 feet. And then you had Jacques Mayol and Enzo Mayorca. And then you had the next generation was Pepin and Umberto Pelizzari. And then the next generation that mm. I'm kind of can say that I was part of growing that aspect. And, and in came. And so after Pepin did that, we ran a course that uh, that, a uh, little introduction course as Pepin came down and he had started a company called International Association of Freedivers, which was basically a vinyl banner and, a, you know, a graphic, but there was no <laughs> standards. There was no book. There was nothing to it. It was a, it was sure. a vinyl banner. Right. And uh, so he was teaching this little introduction class half day during our course. And, uh, and during that Tanya Streeter was in that, uh, that program, she went from like, you know, being a 70 foot free diver and did a hundred feet. And then the idea was floated. Well, maybe she'd like to do a, uh, a U S record. And so, um, I stepped up and offered to help 
train her and coach her through it. And that kind of started the, the process. So she did this US record and then eventually she went on and we trained again for, uh, for a uh, world record in No Limits. And that was actually kind of where I got my first little taste of the potential of what technical freediving could be. Yeah, it's, it's a good segue right there. And I, th I find it quite fascinating and it kind of fits the, the, the ticket that you, because we met for the first time in, in Truck Lagoon in 2017. And that's right. when, I mean, I don't, you've been doing technical freediving yourself for a long time at that point, but I had never seen anything like it. And I lived in Dahab for eight or nine years before that, you know, living with freedivers day to day. Uh, so I found it extremely interesting and and it was so uh, so cool to learn your background, obviously, as a, as an advanced trimix instructor and the rest of it, and how that knowledge carried over into uh, PFI and then technical freediving. But let's uh, let's let's ask the question: How did PFI then begin? Yeah. So, well, I had been in the Caymans, so um, primarily into technical and trimix. I mean, at that time. Uh, I, an average week for me was, you know, actually when I looked at my logbook for the almost five years I was there, I averaged a dive below 60 meters uh, every three days for basically five years. <laughs> and, I, and I had done over a dozen dives in the up to the 175 meter zone, open sure. circuit at that time, right? And because rebreathers weren't even, you know, you had semi-closed rebreathers or you had a, a cis lunar, but who could afford 30 grand at that point, you know? You're messing around with Kevin Gurr's software. <laughs> yeah, it was, yeah, it was, it was his software that, that kind of stopped after 12 repetitive dives. And I, yeah. on my 11th dive, I'd be in there like, okay, I'm on 100% oxygen tonight for an hour, two hours, three hours, three and a half hours, and then go read a book like that. Um and and so yeah that's what i was kind of doing and then and then i realized that there was this you know there's this i was by the end of my time in cayman so by 99 i was almost full-time freediving so i had trained brett lamaster to two records a national yeah. and a world record um and then i trained tanya streeter and helped coach her through from a uh, national record to a world record and and there's my partner mandy ray right there and, and then, so we met, um, when I moved back, when I left Cayman and I moved back to Vancouver in January of 2000. And at that point I started performance freediving and basically threw away all the standards and procedures and educational programs I had written for Pepin, which then had been moved on to another company and, and realized that I needed to start fresh and new. So hmm. I started performance freediving January, 2000, rewrote the standards, the philosophy of the company. And I was gonna base it on really safety and education because previous to that, safety was never talked about. I mean, a blackout was never mentioned. It oh, yeah. was like, if you Taboo. said you had a blackout, it was like admitting you had venereal disease of some yeah. sort, right? <laughs> uh, and if you actually <laughs> said, well, I want to know what a blackout is, it was like, okay, okay, let's go through it. And I thought, yeah. listen, the first thing we got to do is let's get the safety out of the way. Let's get on the same, the same lane here because when we understand safety, then we can talk about adaptations. Then we can mm -hmm. talk about techniques and, and throw that whole package together. So it was really in January of 2000 when I started PFI and it was functionally really the first educational, the first free dive specific educational system that was an educational system that had mm -hmm. standards, had a manual, had an educational philosophy other than, oh, I'm a free diver, here's a card, I'm gonna laminate and say, you know, you came diving with me for a couple of days, here's, you're an instructor as well at the same time. And then in fact, years later, and I tried to get insurance for PFI to really develop the instructional side of that system. And, um, you know, I'm pretty proud that PFI was also the first free dive specific educational system that got insurance that, you know, we, we had been turned down for so long. And then finally sure. one year we were approached by, uh, uh, John Witherspoon about, listen, I'm going to get into this and you're the people we're going to do it with because mm. of your reputation and, and your focus on safety. It's, it's, uh, I, I really, uh, admire your, your, your dedication to safety. It's something that I, I care a lot about considering who my partner is. And then when we're, you know, on okay. the competition circuit worldwide, I'm watching her doing challenging dives. I'm, 
I'm looking at the safety divers, which are incredibly uh, qualified and hardworking. Uh, but sometimes you can feel that they're very tired from the way they do things. So um, maybe we should step back because, I, for example, I've never been to Deja Blue. Tell us a little bit about what is technical freediving and how you've been implementing it uh, from your side. Yeah, so technical freediving is essentially the use of oxygenated mixtures, so something other than air, uh, for the advantages that that can give you, which could be, um, it could be uh, decreased surface intervals, it could be less decompression stress, it could be faster recoveries, it could be longer bottom times, it could be a number of things like this. The shorter mm -hmm. surface intervals, that has to be, that, you know, there's a preface to that one. But there are risks with all of those things and using oxygen, because oxygen can be toxic at certain depths, be toxic to your central nervous system, there's handling issues with, uh, with oxygen, there's making sure you, you um, you test it and you're using the right percentages. So there's all of mm -hmm. these things. It is not to be taken lightly at all. And, and um, so my history in it starts in August of 98 when Tanya was doing a, a training session for No Limits. And we're in Cayman and she's on the boat and it's getting to be dusk and I was safety freediving her, but some of my technical or my trimix uh, safeties were on the boat and I was just breathing off their oxygen talking you know, their last 80%, the last 500 PSI, kind of <laughs> not wasting a drop and yeah, sure. talking with Tanya. And then I had, I had my good friend, Dan Hodgins in the water and, and his buddy. And I thought I better jump in and see how much longer. So I just, you know, one breath off the 80 jumped in, they were at five meters, went down. How you doing? How, how did Tanya look like? What's your, how much time do you have left? You know, and start going on and on and on. And then at, at some point, Dan's like, are, are you okay? And I'm like, yeah, why? And I keep asking him questions on the slate and then eventually he grabs my wrist and he shows me my computer. Yeah, and sure. I was like, I was at five minutes at that point. Now you have to remember at that point in time, Andy Lasauce uh, had the world record in static apnea at seven minutes. Sure. And it wasn't like I prepared. I was just <laughs> chatting on the boat, <laughs> took a breath, just jumped in and happened. did five minutes. And, and <laughs> you know, of course, right away, as soon as I looked at it, I, I realized, holy crap, I didn't feel like I was down there because I wasn't getting contractions. And ding, the light went off as to, <laughs> wow, there's a potential in this, right? So we started playing. I started playing with it a lot. I mean, it bubbled in my mind for a long time before I, before I used it um really into free diving and then started playing with it on you know low mixtures and 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 stuff like that until eventually we started to really kind of bring it out into the forefront and and one of the first things we did um was we worked with david blaine on a on a breath hold he he did in a show in fact he did this two years later in 2008 he did this thing with oprah where he <laughs> did a, a, a guinness world record and did sure. 20 minutes on oxygen live on Oprah and then did a 17 minute and four second breath hold. But in the week prior in the Cayman Islands with us had done over 24 minutes. And, and now that Guinness world record is what, 25 something. I don't sure. even follow it anymore. Right. So, um, but, but really where we started to take the functionality of technical free diving is basically the way I look at it is the right tool for the job. And, and the job can be the working freediver. And so that working freediver is Deja Blue, this competition that we've run. Um, this coming May will be Deja Blue 10. We've had a couple of years off because I've been on Avatar. Sure. Um, and we had four years where it was called Other Names. And really during that time, we have for three weeks, we have safety freedivers who are five ocean sessions a week. They're doing, you know, we're doing hundreds of uh, thousands of dives in in a week and your ass drags at the end of it you're so tired um and so we started using simple mixes like 32 percent for the safety free mm -hmm. divers safetying to 40 meters because that's an appropriate mix and they just will overwhelmingly tell you a huge difference not in the bottom time because we treat it like it's like it's air so we're meeting the athlete at the time we should but in our back pocket if we needed to, because the athlete was slow or having problem at depth, we've just got this extra 25% capacity. Sure. But really where we notice it is at the end of a week, we still got energy instead of, you know, being 
physically exhausted. So that's where it really comes down to the right tool for the job. What are you doing and how are you going to use it? It's it's something that I obviously saw firsthand, like I mentioned, because I was with you in Truck Lagoon in 2017 uh, by accident, but that's where we got to know each other. Yeah. And uh, I can just give uh, the audience an example. Uh, I was diving on the Million Dollar Wreck, the San Francisco Maru. So this is a merchant vessel that's that's uh, 50 meters below the surface. You know, not something a casual free diver can just come and dive on, or or a recreational right. diver for that matter, right? So we're there on yeah. rebreathers with mi mixed gases and the rest of it. And uh, I'm at 50 meters. All of a sudden, uh, Kirk kind of decides to stop by, say hello, and and does his <laughs> four four or five minute you know runtime. And uh, I, I honestly I couldn't believe it. That that was for me just just incredible. And I think. I think that's what's kind of skewed in people's minds as they don't understand what sort of times are uh, technical breath holders reaching in comparison to normal freedivers at depth. Right. Well, you know, Truck Lagoon <laughs> is the perfect playground for not only technical freediving, but scooters as well. So, you know, John Halverson and I and Chris Bustad, uh, who's now the customer service rep at uh, PFI, he, uh, the three of us went on this thing with a good friend, Bill Coltart, who had his buddies as, you know, coming there for the rebreathers. And then that's where we met you. And yeah. so the mix of, of, of oxygenated mixtures on the surface and then the scooter to get you down there so you don't do the work. Um, there's no better playground than, you know, your choice of wrecks from 15 meters to 65 meters. Um, and it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's an amazing, uh, it's a, an amazing time. And so we sometimes use multiple mixes. So I might come up from a dive and be on a 80% mix and then for to off gas and then switch over to another lower mix and making sure that we are doing proper switches because that's a deadly thing if you stayed on the high mix and then went on your dive, right? So there's, there's learning that needs to be done with it. This, this video you're seeing right now is an awesome video of the power of technical freediving in scooters. Yeah, and it goes just goes on and on. Uh, so how do you think technical freediving has progressed uh, today in 2020 into the freediving industry overall? You know, it hasn't. I mean, it is slowly. Um, there's still a lot of naysayers to it. And, you know, first off, let me say I'm a purist at heart. I mean, I, I believe in the purity of freediving. And the, I mean, really, we should be doing it naked, right? I mean, that's the purest form of freediving is naked. But if you decide that you <laughs> want to see and you're going to wear a mask and yeah. you want to propel yourself and you're going to wear fins and then stay warm and keep, you know, a wetsuit and know where you've been, a gauge and so on and so on. So there's nothing better, I think, than just being able to go down. However, something like this, where you can have massive bottom times, you can have shorter surface intervals, and you can just feel like Superman and Superwoman on the wreck uh, and go have fun. Now, this, this video on the Nippon Maru, I mean, this is one video. All we're doing is switching between the forward-facing and the back-facing yeah, GoPro. Sure. And... Um, and so what you don't see is John Halverson on a scooter above me at the surface following along. Cause if my mm -hmm. scooter packed it in and I had to free swim to the surface, not a big deal on this wreck, right? This is, you know, a 40 meter wreck easily done for me. Sure. However, safety is always important. You always have to have a buddy, but on deeper wrecks and, or not even wrecks, but just in deeper general on the scooter, the biggest thing with the scooter safety, the overriding safety principle is don't go deeper or stay longer than you couldn't ditch the scooter and swim to the surface. Now I'm using a dive extra piranha here. Love the scooter. I mean, mm. really reliable and fast and all that sort of stuff. Um, <laughs> it's noisy. It's like a muscle car. <laughs> yeah. Well, the new ones are super silent They're oh, like yeah. in stealth mode there. It's pretty cool. Um, so yeah. And what you're seeing here is just, you know, a fun three and a half, four minute run. Although I did, I forget what record it was on a uh, wreck. It was on, it was a 40 meters. We were playing around and did over, over six minutes of a scooter free dive, you know, <laughs> just, just like Sunday driving, just cruising along, <laughs> you know, for six minutes, enjoying the wreck and then come up to a high mix off gas for a period of time, figure out my surface interval, including the 80% and how I can accelerate it and then go to a low mix 
to get ready and take my last breath off that low mix, which is going to be appropriate for the depth I'm going to. And that's all about controlling oxygen toxicity and partial pressures. And then, you know, go again. But John and Chris and I made the perfect team of three because I'm getting yeah. to the surface there. Yeah, John, finally. John, <laughs> John safeties me. And just as I hit the surface, I Chris, is, Chris is already <laughs> on his way down, right? So yeah, it's, a, yeah. it's a great way to do it. And, you know, you, I see a lot of parallels. You look into the history of the diving industry, you know, when nitrox came out, the voodoo gas, it was yeah, called. Yeah, you know, it, it did, <laughs> yeah it, it didn't exactly get a warm welcome. Well, and, I was uh, all through that. <laughs> yeah, ex exactly. So so it, it, want, it makes one wonder what will happen now with, with technical freediving. But before we carry on uh, further in this interview, I think I want to just take a break and bring Victoria in to ask some uh, questions from the audience. Vic, are you there? Hey, Vic. Good question. Hey. Uh, the first question I have from Stephen Whelan. He's asking, would you ever consider hosting or, run or, or running another world championship event like the 2004 Vancouver World? Oh, I would love to do that. I had such a great time. So when, um, when I was the president of the Canadian Association of Freediving and Apnea, you know, we hosted the Worlds. They ate a world championship 2004 in Vancouver. First cold water um first cold water world championships and we had the greek team there and the mexican team there we had 70 just shy of 80 athletes uh deeper blue and stephen whalen came in force and it was just so much fun it was actually one of the first times we were doing um uh live stream so we had a barge with a flat screen on it and we had seven cameras from a out of water to a at surface water to cameras at depth and we had a switching block and we had this live feed. And I thought, let's set the bar for where these competitions should be like. And then, you know, we haven't seen it again until just most recently with the dive eye. But this is something we were doing in, mm -hmm. in 2004. And by the next day, this video editing friend of mine, Go Iromoto, who was part of Waterborne with me, he was sleeping under my desk in the office uh, <laughs> and editing all night long. So the next day we would stream this video. I, I'd love to run a world championships again. I mean, I have so many ideas of how I'd want to organize and implement a lot of things. And I'd love to do it in the Cayman Islands. It's, you know, it's just the, the functionality and there's some politics within Ida that I've stepped away from years ago. So I don't know, I, I'd love to do it. You know, it just means kind of getting that groundswell of support for people that like to see us do it again. Absolutely. Uh, got Natalie, Natalie Zarkova asking, what's the biggest safety issue in freediving in these days, in your opinion, Kirk? And uh, what are the weak spots we yeah, might face so in the so it really kind of depends on, on what we're talking about um, and, and in what mode, like competitive versus recreational versus spearfishing and all of that sort of thing. I think from a health point of view, we're, we're still trying to figure out uh, lung squeezes. Um, as we're getting deeper and and technical freediving, we have to be careful with this, as we can do quick return arounds uh, using technical freediving, there's decompression illness issues. And, uh, you know, let me announce right here, Aaron, you're, you're gonna get the groundbreaking thing. In January, when I was doing some <laughs> scooter work uh, in the Cayman Islands, so I had taught and then a friend and I were just doing some stuff and I was doing some 100 meter work on scooters. Uh, I ended up having to go to the chamber with a neurological hit. Oh, no way. It's, yeah, yeah. So there. It's the first time I've actually publicly talked about it. It's just a small group of people. And at some point, I'll address it in its own little webinar. Um, but um, yeah, so so there's, there's a lot of different things. Um, back, back in the day, it was just with a buddy, being with a buddy, right? And we've pretty much taken care of that. There's no one that doesn't really know that you can't free dive alone. So I'd say when we look at the safety issues, really there's, there's squeezes, there's decompression illness issues that are definitely rearing its head as we get better in training. And uh, when you look at the research, there's no research into uh, gas modeling as far as decompression uh, goes in free diving. Any computers that are out there are using a scuba model decompression algorithm and sure. trying to adapt it to freediving. But we're a completely different physiology. So yeah, yeah. 
That's a great question, Natalie. Great. Well, just ask one more quick one from Stephen Whelan. Considering how much technical diving is coming in the fore of discussions, do you see it being taught by freediving and mainstream agencies in the future? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm, and I've been saying this for a while, but I'm in the process of developing that educational system around it with the standards and procedures and the support materials and all of those things that will come with it. I know there's uh, a number of heads of other freediving agencies who, who have, you know, said, absolutely not. There's no way we're going to do this. You know, it's not freediving or whatever. And, and, you know, I feel comfortable and confident in it because my background in mixed gas diving exactly. and hyperbarics, I used to, um, I used to volunteer at the hyperbaric chamber in Cayman and, you know, I'm a world in a CMT. And so safety has always been my thing is to make sure that the right educational system supports it because there's a lot of advantages to technical freediving, the right tool for the job. Um, however, there are definitely some hazards that go with it. And it's not just, uh, oh, I heard Kirk talking about, you know, breathing oxygen and going freediving. Let's uh, take that first aid kit out and give it a try. And you convulse from a oxygen toxicity hit on a, on mm -hmm. a dive. So yeah, as far as, as what we're going to, Stephen, we'll definitely be coming out with something. I don't want to put a time frame on it at this point because there's certainly the whole risk mitigation process that we have to go through in designing the right program uh, to support uh, the level of education we're trying to you know, get out there. Great. Thank you very much, Kurt. Thanks, Victoria. Thanks, Vic. All right, let's, let's get right back into it. Um, you know, as, as a technical diver myself, it's been fascinating to have an opportunity to, to, be, a, uh, to be an observer on the competition circuit and see uh, what these people are doing. You know, breaking these limits is absolutely fantastic. Uh, I have noticed how they're doing it and what kind of disciplines are and the rest of it. But do you think you see a space for technical freediving on the competition circuit outside of the safety aspect? You know, no. My personal opinion would be no. Um, when you look at our competition rules that are governed by IDA and others, like CMAS is just getting back sure. into it. Um, that, uh, for example, I think it's an hour, the athlete has to be within the view of the judge to make sure they're not on any oxygen mixture. You know, you just can't have the person coming out of the, the change room and stepping into the pool and holding their breath for 20 some minutes and saying, oh yeah, I was on air. <laughs> Cause you look at oxygen, it's the original doping <laughs> protocol, yeah, sure. right? you know? Um, so no, I think from the purity, the pure athleticism of our sport, Mm. Um, I wouldn't want to see it. It would be like in the Olympics saying, well, okay, now you can dope any way you want. Well, that's not the human no. organism. That's an enhanced organism. Sure. Um, but I think, you know, the Guinness world records and stuff they do, they're, they're interesting. They show the level of human performance at its, at its peak. Um, so yeah, my long and short answer is no, I don't think it should be used in competition. However, supporting the athlete after, Absolutely. And we've done that at Deja Blue for a long time. We've, we've always recommended that if you're an athlete doing, you know, into the 40 meter zone, yeah, go on oxygen for five minutes, make sure you're off of it for an appropriate amount of time too, to, you know, unsaturate your lungs and so on. Um, if you've done over 40 meters, we really recommend it. And if you mm -hmm. have done over 60 meters, we absolutely highly encourage you to use oxygen just as a recovery gas. And it's complimentary to our athletes and, you know, you don't have to pay for it. We don't discourage it. And we have all the systems in place so they can do that. So that's where I really see it. That and the working diver, the safety free diver or the, or the safety scooter diver. And, and they use the gases. They use the technical free diving protocols in, in different ways. Um, yeah. So, so let's uh, touch on hypoxia a little bit because, you know, again, being in Dahab, surrounded by freedivers for years and years and years, and being on the competition circuit, I've seen my fair share of blackouts happen. And uh, but for the normal technical diving instructor or technical diver that are watching, you know, it, it's just their worst nightmare, and it's probably something they've never actually seen before. Right. Uh, so when you look at it as a hypoxic trimix diving instructor, 
uh, and yeah. now uh, in technical freediving, tell us a little bit about how you feel about these parallels and the risk it imposes. Um, so, so sorry, say again. So the risk of, of oxygen for the free diver? No, just the, like how you perceived uh, hypoxia from when you were a technical diver and then when you went into free diving and now in technical oh, right. free diving and the rest of it. Yeah, well, see, here's the great thing with technical free diving is the hypoxia aspect of it is can be almost minimized completely if you're using it like it's air. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're using it to extend your breath hold time, then you're still pushing the edge of hypoxia at that point. So really in the aspect of how you use it, you either get the conservative advantage and safety, increased safety margin, or you get no safety margin at all. You just yeah, get more exactly. performance, right? Uh, so that's what we see. Now, to give you an idea, so I've just spent the last almost three years on Avatar. I spent 31 months on Avatar training cast and crew. That was my job, train the cast and crew, Mm -hmm. um be because you know we, we couldn't use we couldn't use scuba in the water and i can go into that in a little bit uh, in more depth um but before i got there uh there had been one hypoxic issue uh, during breath holding and exactly. then after and then after i got there we had none and to give you an idea our sample rate is a quarter million dives in la alone we logged in over two hundred and fifty thousand free dives <laughs> And at, I know, right? And Quarter at, million. <laughs> at, yeah. And at, uh, at one point, we had 26 people under the water at one point breath holding between the cast and stunts and safety and the people filming because no one could be on scuba, not the Pete Zuccarini behind the camera or his mm -hmm. crew or grip divers who are working uh, because any bubble in the water would create a reflection that the the performance capture suits would cause an issue right um and so that you know that's a that's a great thing and and that's where the right tool for the job was being utilized in in that uh, in that case so i mean we know it works we have a we have a good history with it and within deja blue you know we have how long have we been using it now it must be i say seven years but i've been saying that for the past three years so it's probably <laughs> you know it's it's like 10 years we've been using technical free diving michael Menduno, he'll know he's like researched it all and all yeah, the yeah, interviews yeah. with me right <laughs> um so yeah um well that was the perfect segue really because i wanted to get into your uh, career within hollywood so how did you get into it and and when yeah so I've always done, I've always tried to move free diving to the, the vast audience, to the greater audience. Um, in two that, like Stephen Whalen was saying in 2004 at the world championships, we streamed video the next day. And the two years prior to that, <laughs> before I YouTube, right? <laughs> yeah, before, exactly. So in the two years before that, I was streaming <laughs> video of stuff we were doing when we were putting the quality for dial up, you know, cause <laughs> because that's what the average person had yeah. right yeah. Your work. <laughs> 56 <That's>, k modem <laughs> yeah exactly and so you look at the quality of the product it was all pixelated but then mm. i'd have mandy you know explaining exactly what she's doing at what time and so you know there's high-end people there's the world record holders now multiple world record holders now who i remember back then getting emails from them saying oh this is really cool free diving yeah, what are you doing here? You know, and now they're now they've you know they got a blue hole beside them that they go out and dive and do dozens of world records. Um, but yeah, we've been streaming it since before there was this thing YouTube. Aaron, do you even remember before there was YouTube? Or <laughs> Barely. It was sometime in the nineties. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. I was pretty young back then. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, what was your first project, kind of on the on the big screen then? So it. Um, Mandy and I were involved in a documentary called The Cove, uh, and it uncovered the slaughter of dolphins in Japan. And I was in front of and behind the camera. Mandy was in front of the camera. And we won, uh, yeah, we won uh, Best Feature Documentary. Luis Ahoyas of uh, Oceanic Preservation Society was the director, a good friend, really kind of brought that forward. And then he invited me to another one called Racing Extinction. So we did a, a not a follow-up, but we did another 
ocean-based one called Racing Extinction, and I was involved in that. And definitely lots of times I'd love to have had some sort of technical freediving procedures in, in there. Um, and then the real Hollywood one was, uh, was um, Mission Impossible Rogue Nation. So mm. I, got, uh, I got contacted and Tom Cruise wanted me to train him and Rebecca Ferguson. If you remember, they're in the Taurus, they're in yeah. this you know, basically hard drive under the water. And uh, Tom does this amazing breath hold, and he wanted to do this huge breath hold that the audience would just, you know, see it going on and on. And obviously, to <laughs> for the action, they had to, to cut it up, you know, cut it up the scene. But um, so I employed fifty percent in that. It was and it was a fight. It was a fight with the dive team at that time. I mean, it came to this meeting where they brought their people to say why we shouldn't, and you know, I was saying why we should, and and the hyperbaric doctor who got pulled into this meeting from the dive team trying to say that no oxygen can't be used. And he was just like, well, I'm not sure. I'm just, I'm not on anyone's side. I'm just sure to listen. And, and, you know, <laughs> I was saying to the dive team, listen, you know, breathing oxygen and holding your breath isn't the issue. It's the way you guys want to do it. You, you want to have the person on scuba take a breath, hold their breath. And I said, risk of embolism is your greatest risk here. And if you're going to, if you're going to embolize, embolize with an oxygen bubble, so at least the body metabolizes it. And you could see the hyperbaric doctor at the time be like, bing, you know, that light went off. Well, you know, that's, that's a really good point. So ultimately, I was able to win that argument yeah. uh, without getting to blows with it. But um, but we used it. And, uh, and you know, Tom was, you know, 10, 12 hour shooting day, hundreds of free dives after an hour. And these are two three minute long dives by the time you get into position roll camera ready and and then do the scene and then finish right mm -hmm. and then do that so trying to just not just for the breath hold time and length of it but for the keep the working breath hold day going mm -hmm. and and not exhausted but amazingly i mean tom's just incredible athlete and and you know everyone knows he does his own stunts and in training he did over six and a half minutes in a Jesus. in an air breath hold not technical freedom wow. so you know the whole idea is build the best capacity you can on air and then pull your asa for working you know, yeah, yeah yeah pull your ace out of your sleeve for the working and have that extra advantage to get the job done all day i want to i want to interrupt you on that point and and kind of uh show how small this world is I don't think right. we talked about this in rehearsal, but uh, Jeff, the operator behind the scenes here, Jeff, can you get yourself on the screen? Um, you were working on on Mission Impossible and a movie following that, and you had an issue. What issue did you have when you were on that uh, mission? Yeah, I think uh, I think Kirk's work really inspired Tom and the producers of Mission Impossible because uh, up in the next one, they basically uh, had me doing the same sort of thing, uh, teaching Simon uh, Simon Pegg to uh, use a rebreather uh and and that was in the uh the, the follow-up but uh, yeah i was working on a completely <laughs> different movie uh this is in leaves and studios which is the the harry potter tank yeah. where uh you guys were doing the 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 previous one and uh, i yeah. got this phone call as i get out of the water you know all dripping and he said there's a problem at pinewood you need to get on the phone so you know uh, yeah we've run out of nitrox and i'm thinking you know uh it's a five six meter tank why do you need nitrox in pinewood and it, of course uh, Tom was working on the mummy at the time, and there's a sequence at the end of that where he's right. uh, swimming down through some rocks and some tombs and stuff. <laughs> and uh, you know, they'd gone out to a local dive shop and got a couple of tanks of nitrox because Tom said, you know, my free diving expert says I must breathe up on nitrox. <laughs> and, uh, now they've run out, and uh, Tom's saying, you know, no more filming until you get more nitrox. So I spent the right. evening kind of running around London and uh, going back to my place and bl blending twin sets full of nitrox and then drawing. I'm just trying to over. support the dive industry whenever and wherever I can. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, production, everything's a panic and it can't happen again, you know, and all this kind of yeah. stuff. But uh, yeah, we got Tom his nitrox and uh, yeah, that goes on my CV as Tom's gas blender. <laughs> yeah, right. see you made you made jeff uh, drive all all over, all over london <laughs> now now listen you know we talk about tom being on nitrox but like yeah. listen the guy is a dedicated professional and an athlete and you know in in non-tank confined water training in open water training he did a 40 meter open water constant dive in Jesus. uh in the cayman islands you know so guys just 
an athlete and dedicated to the process and just a, a real treat to work with. And that, that kind of brings me to the next questions, because you've obviously been working with other Hollywood stars on the other projects. I think uh, one of them was especially I was I was breathless when he told me Sigourney Weaver, what, she's 69? What was she doing? Yeah, so, well, she's a character on Avatar. Um, she's obviously coming back. Everyone knows that. And uh, she just had this amazing scene underwater, very active, like, I mean, active you know, the equivalent of running full sprint, basically, uh, in this scene. And she did uh, a two and a half minute breath hold. And the uh, the uh, this friend of mine, uh, Chris Dennison, who was doing stunts, he was kind of on the other side of the camera, you know, trying to be a, an eye line for her. And and uh, and he just kind of took a breath. You know, he didn't you know, like, oh, we'll get this done really quick. And she kept going and going. And I'm I'm watching Chris from behind. And I can see he's like got these strong contractions. I thought, you know, Sigourney Weaver's going to black out Chris Dennison. This is going to be fun. <laughs> we're not worried about Sigourney at this point. We're worried about Chris. No. So, you know, that was, that was the thing with, uh, with the actors and, and she, again, she's an amazing lady and we know her as Ripley, this hardcore, yeah. uh, you know, the original woman action hero. And, uh, and she just, she just loved it. We, every chance we could get, we were, she wanted to do more training and, um, she really was, uh, you know, taking her craft seriously and just loving the breath hold aspect. Kate and, Winslet worked with her a lot yeah. and, you know, all those cast members. In fact, seven of my, my crew, uh, seven of my, my cast that I was training were kids too. I mean, I think age six, Trinity was six maybe when she started. And I think they went to 17, six to 17. Um, you know, so part of, part of the characters are, you know, there's like people who are, they're water-based. They're the Navi of the ocean. Um, mm. You know, you can find this all online. They're called Medicaine and they should have a really poly, they should look like they were born and lived in the ocean. So I had to take that teaching process to that point. And then there, there was other characters who are, you know, they're not the ocean. They're not ocean adapt. They're not water adapt. And so I had to, I had to train them so that the breath hold would be in the background so they could act right you know 80 percent of what they're thinking about isn't oh i'm starving for air yeah, okay. <laughs> you know they got to be able to act but also i had to temper how much i trained them because some of them they needed to look rough and and yeah you know unskilled not, in the water not so and then again they're seven years old to like you know 69 or however sigourney was at the time and uh obviously there was a picture with you there previously with, with james cameron um he's one of my favorite directors um the abyss i mean where do you start with with all the great movies I that know. he's made uh, I, I also often watch uh, behind the scenes uh, of his movies and there's one thing there's a constant is that there's usually a grueling working schedule uh with with james and you've been on it now for years i mean you must be pretty tired <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, um, anyone who works in the water knows that it's like doing three times the work you do on land because just the resistance oh, yeah. of water, just moving, just breathing in the water, you know, just remember you when you enter the water and the water's at your collarbone, your lung volume's only at 60% of its normal and it's 70% harder to breathe because you're pushing all the water out of the way. Plus, you're trying to heat the water and all of these things. Yeah, I mean, a typical... Uh, a short work day for us, you know, a do nothing day was 12 hours. And then when we had principal <laughs> cast and Jim was there, sometimes, you know, we'd get 14, 16 hours, you know, it was, it was Oof. big, but I mean, the most significant diving movie in history, James Cameron's vision of an alien underworld, uh, water world is just, it's going to blow everyone away and, yeah. and, and shot wet for wet. So this is the interesting thing is that, I mean, you can see the cast there and they're wearing their, their dotted suits. And, and so when they're doing the dives, um, when you see their character on screen, breath holding under the water and doing their thing, they actually had to breath hold and do their thing. So this is wet for wet. Um, this isn't Aquaman. This isn't hanging on strings in front of a fan on a dry stage with wind sure. blowing in his hair. Uh, this is full on. So, you know, you have to appreciate the full 
capacity of which all stops were pulled out to get this this not just the james cameron's vision of the underwater world which divers in the audience are going to just be gobsmacked blown away by it but how we had to actually get it done and shot is just incredible as well no no movie ever like it that's too funny i'm, I'm just getting a message here from ian kenny he was with us in truck in 2017 Right. Uh, he, right he, yeah, just, yeah. He, he just reminded me of something that I vividly remember now. Trying to satellite video call James Cameron in Truck <laughs> Lagoon. <laughs> yeah. Well, that, yeah, there. That's right. So three hundred dollars a gigabyte. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, that's right. I got an email. Kirk, answer your answer your phone. It's like you know, it's, I'm just now. in a meeting with James Cameron. Your name's come up, and I'm like, ah, <laughs> middle of the South Pacific. I'll have to call you yeah. when I get back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> totally forgot about that. How how long has the production been now? Well, I mean, I started, I mean, the first thing I really did other, other than an interview with Jim as to, you know, how I would approach training the cast and bringing my skills to it. Um, I think I did, I helped with some casting of the kids, not casting, but they were casting and I basically took them through a watership evaluation and, you know, out of all these kids, I scored them on a thing and said, you know, absolutely just from a water ability and teachability point of view, this is who I'd have. Um, and, uh, so that started in May and then I think by June, I was basically into June, I was on it full time. So uh, is it? Uh, yeah. So this is obviously quite a top secret movie. There's not much you can uh, say, but is there anything you can tell? You know the the water audience out there that might uh, make them look forward to uh, Avatar, two and three. Uh, I, yeah. <laughs> well, that's the thing. We're shooting two and three right now, and I and you know, listen. Everything I'm going to tell you, you can find online. But just let me summarize it for you here. Uh, Avatar two. We've all seen Avatar. We know we've seen the mountain Navi and the plains Navi and the forest Navi. And now you're going to get to see the water Navi. And as you can find online, they're called the Medicaine. And, and Avatar 2 is really about the, the families and, and the ocean. It's primarily an, an ocean movie. And it's just, I mean, just kind of gleaning from what we can the storyline and everything it's just going to be so exciting and the fact that it's water-based and you know imagine the human technology in that world on the water too i mean it's just yeah, gonna be, yeah, yeah. it's good heads are gonna <laughs> you know uh especially the divers yeah we're gonna be having to wear our our, our diapers because we'll be wetting ourselves in our movie seats well, what's the premiere date on, on the second one so december 2021 is the the current one i don't know the exact date and then i think you know if the box office is really good and you know it's strong then hopefully uh four and five get greenlit that's you know I suppose the the plan i've been reading about online excellent um yeah. we have a couple of questions left but before we dip into those i kind of just want to reach out to uh, vic again and see if we get some audience questions uh, vic are you there yes there she is <laughs> Hey, uh, yeah, we've got some questions. Uh, Aaron, one for you from uh, SJ. What's the rubber ducky about? <laughs> oh yeah, this guy. He's been here like since since day one. Um, I don't know. I, I'm kind of I kind of have a stage fright. I, I don't like to be on camera, so so he's kind of been my mascot since day one. <laughs> it only took nine episodes for somebody to notice. <laughs> oh, <I see. laughs> All right. <laughs> um, Kirk, was there a need to adjust the teaching and training process uh, to the needs of uh, acting on a breath hold? That's from Natalia Zarkova. Yeah, absolutely. And and again, uh, just kind of what I had talked about earlier in the in the learning and training process is um, ages. I had male, female. I had young. I had old. I had in shape. I had in really good shape. <laughs> Um, and then I had different levels of the characters. I needed people who had to be look like they were born in the water and people who look like, you know, they were cats thrown in the water, so to speak. Um, and so that training process would be different for everyone. But fortunately, um, Jim and production were really behind the whole learning aspect of this. And so we were given uh, more than enough time in which to do it. 
And so the, the neat thing, when you work with a wide variety of people, um, you really have to use different tacks in how you train, different training philosophies. Um, there was one of the, one of the, one of the kids, Bailey, and, uh, and, you know, from a water point of view, when, when I first met her, I didn't score her very high. Um, and, you know, in the training, in the water portion work of it, she was in the beginning like, oh, you know, do we have to do this again <laughs> type thing? But there was this time, and I'll never forget, she's down on the bottom and she's, we're training and she's doing her thing. And we've got Sunto computers. They've got all the equipment they need. And I see her look down and, and there's no technical nitrox. It's just air stuff. And she looks down and she's like, and she looks at her watch because I've been watching her from the surface. And I see she's like heading into the two minute mark and she's like that. And then you can see if she starts looking around and she comes to the surface and does her recovery breathing and, and uh, everything's good. Everything's safe. And I said, okay, so uh, let's wrap it up now. And she said, oh, do we have to? And I was like, yes. <laughs> you know, it was at that point it went from that switch of I'm really apprehensive. I don't want to do this. Why are we doing this to like, let's keep training. And she like Sigourney became this advocate for just wanting to train and to see her change from not wanting to really be a water person to really being a great water person and a free diver and looking like she was born into it was, uh, was really cool. Fantastic. Uh, we'll just take one more question from Maxwell Hone. What exercises do you do each day to maintain your breath hold abilities? And does staying dry for long periods of time affect your breath hold? I can assume he's talking about while you're on set. Yeah. Um, so when we don't get water work or even just at home during this whole COVID crisis, yeah, sure. I mean, it's pretty simple and straightforward. I mean, um, you know, for me, it's a the, the pools aren't open. There's no go training at the pools. Um, so, you know, for me, it's taken the, the dog for a, a strong a workout hike. And then Kyla and Mandy and I go and do these big, long walks with our dog, Holly. And then, you know, the other things that are really simple and straightforward to do. And in fact, I'm going to touch on them in a Facebook live series I'm doing called, called vitamin F, which is going to be on the PFI Facebook page. And it's going to be about giving people a leg up in the COVID crisis, but this applies to free divers at home. There's really simple, straightforward things, flexibility training, both inhalation and exhalation, flexibility training. That's good. Strengthening respiratory muscles through exercises like segmented breathing, uh, doing dry CO2 and O2, uh, static table training. So there's a number of really simple things uh, from a free diver's point of view, making sure the ears are going to continue to work. So doing 200 equalizations a day, making you're using good friends, throat piston action, doing those on exhalation. So there's a whole bunch of things that are simply mm -hmm. done on your couch in the safety and uh, of your home that are, that are due that keep you and your physiology adapted and basically sharp. Great. Thanks very much, Kat. Thank you. So that's vitamin F on the PFI Facebook. When's that coming out for people that want to? Uh, when is the first one on the 21st? Yeah. And so first one, I have Dr. John Shedd, who's been our competition doctor in the Cayman Islands. He's a FEMA remote trained trauma doctor and this, all this sort of stuff. And so I'm going to interview him of just about the, um, the healthy aspects that free divers and our lifestyle bring to uh, you know, not just having a healthy lifestyle, but in the, in the times of COVID and mm. it being a respiratory illness, sure. um, if I'm trying to fight off getting it, or if I get it and I'm trying to recover from it, or I'm going through the rehabilitation after mm -hmm. it can be a really lung, uh, affecting disease. So what are those things that free divers and our, our adapted physiology and the physiological respiratory advantages that we enjoy compared to the rest of the public. Mm -hmm. uh, what can we do? So it's a three part series. I'm going to have uh, my partner, Mandy Crock. She's going to come on. We're going to mm. talk about certain aspects. Ashley Chapman's going to come on from Evolve Freediving. She's going to take us through stuff that she does. And, and then Chris Adair, who's a sustainable harvester and how he uses it in his in his harvesting, uh, free diving. And so each segment will touch on something new and show a new set of skills that people can do dry at home and follow along. 
That's excellent. It just makes me think about on the second episode we had, uh, we had Matt Jevin, who's a rebreather instructor, uh, which had COVID. So he's had COVID and it was, right. and it was, uh, you know, not an easy case. He had to visit the hospital for a night uh, here and then, and, you know, he didn't get incubated, but uh, he wasn't feeling well for quite a long time. And uh, yeah. he's recovered now and he used, you know, some of his knowledge based on technical diving and recovery. And uh, he's been talking to Natalia and, and behind the scenes about the freediving aspect of it. So there's definitely uh, some some advantages that we have have here in terms of that. Yeah, uh, ab absolutely. And so looking back at, at this, because now we're at the end of the talk and we've kind of covered... A, a, a long and extensive career in many different aspects. Um, so I'd just like to ask you kind of, what, what are you most proud of uh, looking back at this career? Besides having a, a daughter who's who's a, a avid and passionate freediver herself at mm. 10 years old. Um, no, I'm really, I mean, I. I love my career. I consider myself, I'm, I'm, I'm a free diver, but I consider myself a diver because I've swam in the, you know, the recreational side of the pool, the technical side and mm -hmm. the free diving. I'm all things diving. And, uh, and you know, that's my tribe and my community. Um, really it's, it's the development of an educational system with PFI at such a time that I was, I, I think I was able to, um, affect the professionalism by which free diving should be taken, especially from an educational point of view. There's a lot of educational systems out there now. Um, you know, there's like three of them that uh, were, you know, the people who head them up were my students. Um, mm -hmm. And instead of this kind of being like surfer, hang loose dude, you know, we really took it professional because that's what it deserved from the safety aspect point of view. Sure. And, and I think, you know, Dan and the Rolex Diver of the Year Award recognizes that. So um, just to see where where freediving is nowadays and how it's taken professionally and, and how I've been able to lend a hand in getting it to that point in my career professionally with it which has been for over the past 20 years, but 20 years as PFI, that's probably what I'm most proud of. Excellent. So uh, that kind of brings me into what, what are your words of advice for younger generations of divers, uh, be it free divers, techies, or uh, that are looking for success in the industry and they want in with, without giving too much away, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, first, first off, um, you know, that's my daughter and I right there. I love that shot. Um, yeah, first off, a, a, a young person getting into this industry, uh, think of diving as a whole. And that includes scuba diving and technical diving and free diving. And make sure you're interdisciplinary. You might, you might focus more towards one. So if you're a technical diver, there is great cross training being a free diver. In fact, when I was teaching Trimix programs, I used significant educational components of my freediving programs within my Trimix, um, just from a water adaptation and water comfort and efficiency and, and breathing, obviously. Um, so take advantage of all those things. Take advantage of all the mentors that are out there. Oh, yeah. Um, there's all these platforms, Aaron, what you're doing right now is great. And there's this access to this amount of information from the people with the know-how and the experience, the subject matter experts in their field, as we're doing right now, to be able to just really dive into it and, and really learn. Uh, and consider yourself a professional. Um, and take a professional attitude about how you approach your work in the process by which you learn mm. the diving industry. Um, because it's, you know, there's a 73% of this world is, is water-based and what better way to explore it with all the technology and capacity and training we have in which to do it now. And so it's really cool. So one of the things I'm really excited for is, you know, free diving. We have some really great performances going on right now. But wait till my daughter's generation who grew up learning how to free dive properly. I mean, when she yeah. was, you know, four years old or something like that, we're driving away from the dive site in Hawaii and she's in her in her booster seat in the back and we're driving along and she's looking out the window and we start to realize she's saying to herself, hook, thousand, 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 hook, 
thousand. <laughs> and she was talking about recovery breathing, right? Yeah, sure. And so, so the other cool old. thing right now is she's going through her SDI junior open water program online. And, uh, and it's just blowing me away all the stuff she knows, or she, she'll know the topic, but she'll know something else about the topic. Right. Yeah. So her generation and how they're able to learn with all the mentors and all of the, you know, all of the advantages, um, be it free diving or technical diving or whatever it's going to be, you know, her generation and the performances they're going to do in free diving, we can't even fathom it. No, I, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, I guess that's kind of us starting to wrap up here. I think we have one more announcement to do and, and possibly a shameless plug uh, because uh, I guess it's time for us to go diving again, Kirk. What do you think? Uh, yeah, let's do it. I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me we're going to truck. <laughs> yeah, we're going to truck. So uh, any, anybody that's interested here and has been watching uh, Freediver or Rebreather for that matter, uh, we are doing a free dive, technical freediving trip on scooters with Kirk Crack in Truck Lagoon. So this is going to be happening from the 16th to the 25th of January 2022. So plenty of time to plan and get ready. So Let's get uh, this whole COVID thing out of the way and exactly. get out there and have some fun. And this will be uh, right after the premiere of Avatar. So there'll be plenty of... Uh, Water-based oh, things. Oh, I'll going be on. able to talk a lot then. Come on the trip, <laughs> so I can tell you all the juicy stuff. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Who's our first person? I understand we already have a we have someone. I'm excited to uh, not besides you, but yeah. Well, you know, there was only one person except you and uh, me and the team that knew about him. That's Natalia. <laughs> so uh, she's. Uh, we had a chat today, and and uh, she's going to be coming. So this is going to be uh, a great I'm trip. So excited to work with her on the trip. It'll yeah. be super cool. Yeah, you, you, you guys in the water, the photography we can make uh, on the wrecks. Obviously, we have, like, I have a, a fifteen thousand dollar camera set up. You know, three two hundred thousand lumens of lights, uh, and uh, who knows if I can uh, get Jeff to bring his red camera along. I mean, the sky's the limit of the media. Do we're it up produce. right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> awesome. Uh, so I, I think that kind of wraps up our episode. I mean. Kirk, thanks so much again for for uh, coming clean with us on the Dirty Dozen. It was so much fun, and and it was a really honest and and uh, and fascinating insight into the into the world of technical freediving. More than I found out with, with you in trucks. So, so thank you so much. Well, thanks for the invitation. It was great, Aaron, and uh, look forward to blowing some bubbles or at least holding my breath, right? In truck. <laughs> <laughs> Looking forward to it, buddy. All right, All right, I'll catch you on the flip side. Take care. See you, brother. All right. That kind of wraps up our ninth installation um, of Coming Clean with uh, Dirty Dozen. Thanks, everyone, for watching. And I just kind of wanted to remind you that eight episodes are already on YouTube. And this one will be uh, as well tomorrow, should you have missed some of it. You can also watch it, obviously, on Facebook. And the audio version of it, if you want to listen to it in your car, on your phone, it's on uh, Spotify, it's on Google Podcasts, and it's on Apple Podcasts. So you can find Coming Clean with a Dirty Dozen on there as well. Um, re remember to press the notification bell and the subscribe button and whatever these YouTubers now say. Um, so thanks for, for coming. Um, join us again on Thursday, uh, May 21st. We're going to have an interview with uh, Gabriel Pineda from uh, Shearwater. And the topic is Shearwater and the real-time decompression revolution. Uh, this is an episode that I've been uh, looking forward to as well. It's found, found to be uh, super interesting to get the, uh, the background story on, on Shearwater. So without any further ado, uh, I'm, I'm your host, uh, Aaron Arngrimson. Stay safe in these a little bit less wilder times now. Uh, remember to take care of yourself, wash your hands, uh, and, and, and take care of each other. And if you uh, feel lonely, we're here to chat dirty. See you later, guys. <laughs>